really need to get ready because it's so unbelievable. It's going to seem fake, but I promise you it's not. Grace will vouch for me. It depends if you tell it right. There is no way not to tell this right. It is a storyteller's wet dream. <laughs> For our term 12, this is Grace. Remember, you're not their parent, you're not their therapist. You are here to create a safe environment, and that's it. Got it. Luis, you better be up. So this is how it's going to be. Community meeting is now in session. Mm, slow this down a little bit. Y'all yeah. ain't got no rhythm, man. Mace, I love you like a brother, but I got to say that when it come to being discreet, you're a disgrace. I mean, you think we all don't know about him and Grace on the low, undercover, trying to date? <laughs> so nice to me? Well, it's easy. You are the weirdest and most beautiful person that I've ever met. Hey! 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 hey, hey. You need to tell me what the hell is going on. You have to let me in your head once in a while. I'm just gonna go nuts. We have a new member of our community. She's been in and out of group homes for dangerous behavior. I told her father we take good care of her. I take good care of everyone. Happy birthday. I really think we need to talk through some of this stuff. Tonight. All right, now. I just need to work. Jaden, come on. Please, just open the door. I am on the floor every day with those kids. And last night, that girl sat next to me and she cried and she tried to tell me the only way that she knew how. Grace, it's not your job to interpret tears. I've been waiting for three years for you to just once take the advice that you give your kids every five minutes and learn to talk about what's going on inside your head. So let's all lift our glasses to our king and queen. Everything good in my life is because of you. You know we can do this, right? Another one of those films that was so incredibly worthwhile. Uh, do you want to just talk for a moment about what it took to get that film made? Sure. Thank you, Declan, and nice to see you. And and thank you, Matthew C. Um, Matthew is also an Altman producer. I trained under him. Not really kidding. Um, uh, and thank you guys really for coming and thank you for staying. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it is a miracle that any movie gets made. And uh, one of the things I used to say in the, in the Altman days was um, you have to get the cash and the cast and the calendar to line up. So those three C's, and it's really hard to do. It's maddening work. You get a little bit of a commitment from a cast member. You try to get a little bit of money. Can you get the calendar to fit? And can you get all of those pieces to sort of square? And <clears throat> with a film like this, it's a little different. The algorithm is maybe a little different because for, for a few reasons. One is I love these actors so much, and I hope you guys love them as much as I do. And um, yes, thank you. Um, they're so gifted, and those kids are so gifted, but none of them are namey names. I mean, Brie Larson is known in the industry. John Gallagher Jr., who plays Mason, is known in the industry, uh, both for Broadway, where he's won a Tony Award, and uh, because he's on the newsroom now, Aaron Sorkin show on HBO. So there's a lot of esteem for those guys, but it's not the kind of cast you usually have to put together to make the financing work. And partly, we were able to do that trick on this movie because, a little bit because the stars aligned. Um, and, and here's how they aligned. If, and if this is boring, I'm not kidding, like just wave a hand and I'm gonna go on to the next question. But the, the this, we all, so I, I'm part of a company called Animal Kingdom, and we were, we were a brand new enterprise in July of 2012. And we read this script, all of us, and all fell in love with it and thought, like, we just love this material so much, we have to find a way to make this movie. The only way to make it um, was pretty cheaply. Because on the face of it, uh, as much as it's, I think, um, and it's, it's been so happily received, it's been so well reviewed, even though we, we were responding to the same quality in the writing that the reviews have sort of happily borne out. On the face of it, it's not commercial. 
you know, you, you've got a, a tough subject matter. It's set in a foster care facility. Everybody in it is sort of 25 and under, um, with the exception of the, the, the bad guy, in a way, Jack, who runs that facility. So th there was kind of no way to cast, I mean, not that there aren't naming names who are 25 and under, of course there are, but it almost would have been wrong for this movie. One of the things I think that's wonderful about this cast is even though you might recognize John, you might recognize Brie, and Brie rightly has been celebrated um, over the last nine months or so, both for this film, for uh, Don John's addiction, um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's film in which she has a part for The Spectacular Now in which she has a part. So she's sort of been queen of the last four months in a way. But you lose yourself in the movie so much more easily, I think, because you don't know who these actors are. Um, it's just a different experience. And because so many of the cast is, are really kids, they're 18 and under, um, that became the, the matrix for this movie. And that was liberating because um, as you well know, the, the game you're usually forced to play is can I get this star or that star to commit even before I'm financed so that I can finance the movie against their commitment and then again try to get it all to fit in the same sort of five weeks or four weeks on the calendar. So that made this film a little bit simpler to put together and the other thing that made it simpler to put together was the faith of our financier who didn't need um, those names. Uh, and again, it's an intricate algorithm that fails as often as it succeeds, where you, you know if you have actor X and actress Y, your foreign sales are going to be Z, and therefore you can make the movie for Z minus 10, and you might come out OK. Um, we, were, we were relieved from having to go through that particular uh, set of things. So I read this script actually end of June in 2012, and we were in prep August 15. Like, it never happens that way. And that was one of the happy uh, accidents of this movie. A and that's why we were able to, to get it made. And we were actually in theaters less than a year after we started shooting the film, which also never happens. We just have been unreasonably fortunate. I, I had that moment while I was watching the film early on, uh, as I saw Brie, the lead actress, within one of the early scenes, and I immediately thought, oh, I wonder what it would be like if Kristen Stewart did it. Uh, and I mean that seriously. Yeah. I immediately went to that kind of thinking about, um, you know, would it have played better as a moneymaker, as a commercial film? And I'm just curious, because the film is perfect. And, and I know that kind of movie where it transcends the cast and you just forget about that and that's a great experience but very hard when you're trying to sell the movie. Yep. What, was there a moment where people were thinking, oh, if we could just get Kristen Stewart to play the lead, we'd be okay? There was. Um, I mean, there, was, there were conversations about that more than a real moment. And, and again, I, I think really, I don't even want to say smartly, it, like nothing warrants the word smartly, but happily, we had a financier who was willing to make the commitment to this film without that. So uh, after a few conversations, uh, we also, we wanted to get the show on the road. Uh, Destin, who wrote and directed this movie and is such a remarkable uh, talent and friend and human, um, he had had a first feature, this, the short uh, by the same name that this film grew, grew out of the same seed from was Destin's short. It won the jury prize at Sundance. So part of what our impetus was in not waiting was let's get into production. We should shoot, you know, the festival life is the way for any indie to find its way into the world. Uh, Sundance is the logical place because the short won a prize there because Destin's first feature, uh, which is a beautiful movie called I Am Not a Hipster, um, played in the next, uh, that's, next is one of the sort of categories of film at Sundance for smaller, lower budget movies that are a little bit edgy. And that was part of the impetus. It was sort of like, let's, let's go. And again, the thing that made that possible was the financier was willing to say, let's go. Um, so we didn't have to entertain those conversations for too long, which otherwise, uh, you guys, takes years. I mean, years. You can, like, I think, I'm pretty sure Kristen Stewart's interested, and we'll wait until there's a 
and I, I'm just using her in the abstract, we did not talk to her about this movie, but you know, we'll wait until she has a window somewhere between the big movies she's gonna be making. And God bless Kristen Stewart, she does these kinds of movies, and she just did one this summer. So it's wonderful, and uh, you know, again, when you're, we were able to basically bet on the film and bet on the filmmaker, and happily, that bet came in. So we took the film. Uh, we actually didn't get into Sundance with this movie. Um, also part of our strange story, um, we, we showed them a cut that was certainly not the cut you just watched, but uh, the film didn't work for them for whatever reason, and we ended up going to South by Southwest in Austin a couple of months later, and that ended up being the happiest, again, sort of fate for us. So we won the jury prize there and the audience award there, sold the film there, found a distributor who was also, you know, either foolish enough or visionary enough to take the movie out. And, um, and we had our theatrical run, which actually was a healthy one by current standards. It's so hard to get people to come out, which is again why it's great you guys are here. But we ran in New York from August 23rd for 10 weeks, which is a good long run at the Sunshine. Uh, played at the Arclight in LA, and I think made it to about probably 25 or 30 cities overall. Which for a, a picture like that, that's considered a, a home run. Yeah. Uh, I just want to turn it over uh, to, to you folks. Uh, someone must have a question, yes? Yeah, the, the question was how did, how did the writer, director, how did Destin find, find this material or what was the impetus for this film? Because it's such a world unto itself that most people don't know. How did, how did it occur to him to write this picture? And the, and the answer is just what you would suppose probably. Uh, he worked in a facility like this for about two years. It was his first job after college. He tells the story essentially like he, he got a job because it was the only job he could get that offered health care. And he took it. And uh, he says the Nate character that Rami Malek plays, the one who says all the foolish things at the start of the movie, is basically him. Um, Destin's such a warm, sensitive guy that you can't imagine him quite wrong-footing himself that much, as much as Nate does in the film. But De Destin says it, it happened that way. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that happens to Jaden, uh, Caitlin Deaver's character, where her father doesn't show up on her birthday, and then she has that meltdown. And, and he said that, that happened to him. There was a guy whose dad didn't show up, and the kid just blew up and threw a chair at him. Uh, they had to force their way into the room. The guy punched Destin in the face. And 20 minutes later, it was all over and they were sitting in a room like that cool down room, you know, comparing notes of like, you okay now? Yeah, okay, let's get out of here. That's a great point and I I'm sure, I'm not sure, was that intentional? Because the film did very much have that feeling where for a moment there, you don't know if you're living in the documentary world or in the feature film world. It, it, it was largely a creative decision, and, and I think the right one for this material. You do want to feel like you're lost in this world, not like, you're, not like it's being staged for you. One of the great things that Destin said at our early production meeting, production meetings are when you have all your heads of department, your production designer, your costume designer, um, your first AD, and you all talk about the impossible challenges you have ahead. And one of the great things that Destin said is, uh, and, relatively early um, was, I'd love to make this film so that it looks like none of our fingerprints are on it. Uh, and I think largely that worked really beautifully for the movie. Um, I mean, and, and to be fair, part of it's also financial, it's economic. We had to make this film inexpensively. Uh, it's cheaper and faster to shoot handheld and that's what gives it that verite doc look. Um, and again, uh, to me, one of the lovely things about the movie is the way it uses that, those rhythms. I, it's easy to get verti uh, vertigo or get a little bit dizzy when that camera keeps moving, and I, I love our, our DP was also our, our A camera operator, meaning he's literally got it on his shoulder, right? He's shooting it. And I think he has this lovely sort of, you feel someone breathing, you sort of feel someone watching, but you mostly don't feel that kind of uh, windshield wiper thing going on. And, and a little bit it allowed him to also, allowed the DP, again this wonderful guy who's shooting in New York right now named Brett Pollack, allowed him to be responsive to the actors so he could also 
uh, play with them. And Destin tells the story in the rap that, uh, that Marcus has. Again, Keith Sanfield, amazingly gifted young guy. Um, in that rap, Destin just let Brett shoot it. And he gets kind of unreasonably close to him almost. And you're just sort of looking at pieces of his face. And it adds to that intimacy. It was just an intuitive decision that ended up being the one we kept in the cut. There's another much more standard shot of it where he stays back. When we were under the gun, and you're always under the gun, even on a large budget movie, you're under the gun, right? You've got to make your days. You've got to get a certain amount of stuff shot. Uh, one of his, um, I think it was a, a Zen poem to himself, but it was also a, a one that he followed was, all I got to do is get my actors. Like all I need to do, basically, like I got to just, all I need to do is make room and time for the actors, uh, everything else, it should be secondary, and I think he made that the priority, which good good decision. The location question is the easy one. Um, it was a former foster care facility, and it was about 40 minutes north of Los Angeles. It was actually up in the Angeles Forest. Uh, the county had sold it, uh, I'm not sure how many years before we were there, but four or five years earlier. It had been taken over by a, a Korean Christian church, it had, it had the unimprovable name of Hallelujah Prayer Center of USA. Um, but they were in the position of still converting it for their use, which was to become a camp for them to bring retreats, kids, kids there on retreats. And, and that's always a location manager's dream, when you find a site that's in between uses, because it means that someone is willing to take your meager amount of money and let you have the run of the place, because it's more than they're getting while it's sitting fallow, but they can't use it yet. So there were two campuses there, and uh, there were, they were largely on the upper campus and down a little hill, was that those four buildings that you sort of see when in, the, in the wiffle ball game. And, and again, it was a, to make a movie on the cheap, because again, we, we had to do it that way, you need that kind of good fortune. So we, we were shooting basically in one wing, we were staging, um, wardrobe and the rooms that the kids live in, that's those, those dorms are in all the buildings. So those were our dressing rooms, those were our changing rooms. Um, that was in another building. We, we did catering out of there. It all managed, uh, and, and three, a little more than three of our very brief four weeks of shooting were all in that one place. And that's what made it work. And it felt like paradise to be there. It, it had the extra attraction of being up in the mountains so none of our cell phones worked. So we had the relief from that constant, you know, tap, tap, tap. Um, we did have internet, which we needed for business, but it was great. We had to literally walk to the edge of a cliff and stand by a chain link fence to get an AT&T signal, <laughs> which we did when we needed to, but happily didn't uh, when you didn't need to. The kids, mostly when you're, when you're casting kids, you're casting the parents too, right? Because that's who you got to work with. And we got so, again, lucky in that regard because uh, all of these kids who play such troubled souls were like the, the most wonderful, well-adjusted people. And their parents were the same. Um, so, so they had all read the script. They all knew what the subject matter was gonna be. The parents had all read the script. And there were maybe a couple of moments where we had to talk through something or talk about what was about to happen. But largely, it, it sort of took care of itself. Uh, Brie and John, um, again, our Grace and Mason in the movie, had amazingly uh, good, warm, informal relationships with those kids. And a lot of, uh, and, and played with them often, you know, when the cameras weren't rolling, which again helps develop some real both trust and nuance of relationships when the cameras are rolling. And, and one of the things that Destin did that I, think also pays off in nuances that are beautiful in the movie. Sometimes we would yell cut um, and he would keep shooting the kids. Just to grab that shot of you know the kid falling asleep on the couch or um, uh, some of the brushing the teeth stuff. Uh, some of that was of course organized and lit and shot but sometimes after we would have after we would light uh, the kids are just hanging around and 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 you don't know on a digital camera whether you're rolling or not. It's easy to be a little bit sly, um, and we would just pick up bits and pieces of those kids. Um, one of the, I mean, one of the, Caitlin, who plays Jaden, who I think is so wonderful in the movie, 
is like th such an actress already. She was 15 when we shot this film. She's 16 now. Um, she's done a lot of work. She's been on the Justify, the FX series. Um, she did a Curb Your Enthusiasm. She, she just, yeah, she's, she, she's, yeah, the 15, yeah, yeah. She's something, and, and so she's like this actress, even though she's 15, and, and she plays the role so, you know, I, I, I think so well and so convincingly. And then as soon as, you know, we would cut, it's like, yep, yeah, she's a 15-year-old girl. Um, you know, with this great dad who was always there, always present, uh, Alex Calloway, who plays Sammy, the very scrawny, wonderful Sammy, who, of course, frames the film. Um, as he said at a Q&A once, all I had to do was be skinny and yell. <laughs> and he's like the most voluble, uh, articulate, crazily unrepressed human, and yet he plays Sammy beautifully. His dad's this great guy um, who thought my kid wants to be an actor, I'll take him to LA and we'll see how it goes. They literally just arrived, we found him and it's like, let's go. So we were really lucky with our kids. He, he had made a first feature, which is a, a micro budget film, this film called I Am Not a Hipster that was at next at Sundance. So partly he was on the map, industry map that way. This script though, um, which is also a, a worth noting, won a Nichols Fellowship. So the Nichols Fellowship is a very prestigious thing awarded by the Academy, the same people who put the Oscars together. And Destin's, this script was a Nichols Fellowship winner, but at that point he had never made a feature and the subject matter was daunting enough and a first time director was daunting enough that not, it, it, the pr production did not come together for him. When he made Hipster, uh, it, it resonated enough, it was beautifully reviewed. It is a, I Am Not a Hipster is an amazing film that I have nothing to do with so I can, blow its horn uh, without any um, mortification. It's about a, and not to derail this conversation too much, but it's, it's such an incredibly assured piece of work that I think it kind of is a testament to Destin. It's about a guy in his early 30s or late 20s who's lost his mom a couple of years before the film starts and moves to San Diego where she was from in some, you know, never quite expressed way to connect with the memory of her. And he's a singer-songwriter, and you see him performing these very uh, re wrenching, uh, beautiful material. And, and his, he basically didn't go to the service for his mother, he just took off. And in the course of the movie, his sisters and father come to reclaim him and have some kind of moment of remembering their mother and his, and his father's wife. So that's heavy material. <laughs> And he handles it so beautifully in that film. And uh, Joel West, Joel P. West, who wrote the score for our movie, wrote those songs and was a friend of Destin's from San Diego. Destin went to school in San Diego and was living there. And, and that he could make that film, uh, again, and he shot that for uh, such a low number, uh, you wouldn't believe it, um, was part of how we had come to know about him and come to be a believer. So the Nichols Fellowship, uh, and this script had actually also been kicking around, he had enough currency that it had been kicking around for a while. Um, people at sales companies knew it, and again, everyone had kind of been afraid of it. So I give us the credit for not ultimately being afraid of it. But, uh, but that's sort of the answer to how, how Destin got on our radar. Um, did you seek it out, or did it get... We sought it out, actually. We had, uh, David Kaplan, one of the guys I work with, used to work at Synetic, a uh, sales company in New York, where they're basically, one of their pieces of business is putting together third-party financing for independent films. He had always loved the script. Synetic had always loved the script. And David said, you know, you should read this. <laughs> so we read it. Uh, we kind of knew that it didn't have a life, but it had almost had a life or two. And then we pursued it. Um, and, and I basically flew out to L.A. and sat down with Destin in mid-July and had a few tiny script notes that he was responsive to and in fact he was ahead of me on because he gave me a draft five days later that not only had all of those things already done but had the whole Marcus story that ends our movie was not in the original draft I read and that was a lovely thing to get. So Keith Stanfield is the actor who plays Marcus and he's such a remarkable like person as well as I think wonderful of course actor in our movie and, and anywhere. Um, 
And there's a good story. And very briefly, we were auditioning in LA. It's, it's the end of August, a year ago. And seeing even some gifted people, but no one who had the trouble, who resonated the trouble and the life that Marcus has in him. And um, one of the things you hear about kids, kid actors, and not, Marcus is old enough not to be a kid, is you see a lot of Disney kids. You know, you see a lot of kids with unreasonable polish, and in spite of that being a gift of a kind, it's not what you want in a film like this, of course. So we were, uh, we, we just didn't know who our Marcus was gonna be. Um, Keith was one of the only, he's, he's the only actor in this film who was also in Destin Short. And as we were mulling, like, what are we gonna do about Marcus, I asked Destin, what about the kid in the short? He's good. And Destin said, I've been trying to find him for a month. And uh, he doesn't have a cell phone. He hasn't answered any emails I've sent. And I just don't know where to find him. And about four days later, Keith answered an email. And as he said, I don't get very many of them. I only check my emails once a month. <laughs> and he was living in Victorville with his mom about two hours outside of LA. Um, he and Destin love each other, like they have a real connection. They really know each other well. And they, again, had made the short in 2008. Um, Keith drove himself into LA in Destin's apartment. Destin taped him uh, doing the rap and doing another uh, scene and sent us the, the video link and it was, it was all over. It was like done. <laughs> and, um, and I rightly said, like our film just got twice as good. This actor is so wonderful. Um, Keith, Keith, Keith now has representation. Um, so hopefully Keith will keep working. And he is, uh, he's also a really unusually smart, creative guy. And if you want to be entertained, look at his IMDb page and read his bio, which he wrote, which is entirely false, but en endlessly entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, Destin has a project. Uh, he had a, we started talking even when we were cutting about, what's your next film, buddy? Because... Uh, I think he's so gifted and I loved working with him. And he had a project um, that I loved the sound of and he said, I wanna write this movie for my mom. So it's already kind of like, oh, how can I say no? Um, and he, his mom, he's one of six kids. He grew up in Hawaii, um, working class kid. His summer job was cutting pineapples in the field. And his mom, he said his mom was a hippie and with each child she got increasingly conservative because that's what happens. And, uh, and then as in, a, in the course of about 18 months, suddenly every kid had left, you know, either left Hawaii or left the nest. And his mother started to reclaim her identity in ways that were shocking to the children. <laughs> and he basically said, I wanna make a movie of that. I wanna have this film where she goes on a road trip um, and stops in at each of the kids' houses and, and keeps unpacking herself in ways that horrify and delight her children. And I loved the sound of that movie, and I hope Destin writes that movie. But that has been put on hold um, for the good reason. I mean, mostly we've had him on the road for, like, since South By. We have been to festivals from way too uh, glib sounding an answer, but it's true, from Lo Little Rock to Locarno, and, and Destin has basically been on the road for most of the last six months, uh, which is very both... Uh, you know, cool and completely consuming. So he, he has not had a whole lot of time to write. This, uh, in the last six weeks, um, because of the beautiful reception the film got, and I hope because of the real virtues of the film, Destin is now um, uh, looking at doing a studio movie, and he knows that's going to be a very different situation. But he's writing an adaptation of a book um, for Lionsgate for Jennifer Lawrence to star in which actually sounds like it will be a beautiful fit for him, and it's like a, kind of a holy shit moment, um, what you hope happens when you're a, an independent filmmaker. You wanna keep making your own movies, but you would really love somebody to pay you. So I hope that happens, and I hope he also makes a beautiful film, which I think he has every chance of doing. I can't remember, and I should. Um, I could get my phone out and look. Um, they have a funny answer. So Destin wrote a version, and Keith, uh, with a real twinkle in his eye, said, yeah, he wrote a version, <laughs> but I sharpened it up. Um, so Keith made it his own, um, but I, I, Destin's version in the script is beautiful, uh, but Keith 
gave it a few more teeth. Yeah, thank you. And Keith obviously also gave it all of that heart. <laughs> um, the song that plays over the end credits in the film um, also has a great story. So Keith, we didn't have any music for the end crawl. And um, Keith came in to do ADR. Do you guys know what ADR is? Um, where you basically come in and record lines that for either technical reasons or sometimes performance reasons need to be re-recorded. And Keith came in and did ADR, which wasn't a lot, a few lines. And Destin said, you know, while you're here, would you go out and write something and then come back and we'll record it and maybe we can use it in the film? So Keith went away for two hours, came back with that rap fully written, laid down that rap, and then we got this crazy guy to mix it with that music, and that's the, movie, the music that's over the end titles in the movie. Such a beautiful indie. I mean, it's a great. Uh, thank you very much. And can I just ask, because I'm curious, uh, how many days did you shoot for? 20 days. How many? 20. Four weeks. 20. 20 days. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Thank Josh you guys so Astrakhan. much for coming.